Welcome to the first uh, of uh, four roundtables uh, that we at AFCO are organizing over the course of the summer. Uh, the first one uh, is sponsored by Erste Group, and uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Erste are also our main sponsor for our annual event on the 8th of October. And the topic of the, today's um, discussion uh, is basically what are the various funding concepts that are, that, uh, are needed to uh, not just get over uh, the current crisis, but particularly to sustain or, or and, and develop um, innovation and growth in our economy, and not just in our economy, but, but um, Europe as a whole. So that is our topic, um, in, also in relationship to other sources of finance from the private side, you know, state financing, uh, bank financing. So we're going to discuss the whole birth of financing options. Uh, thank you very much to the, to the panelists, um, and particularly thank you very much uh, to Dayan uh, for uh, organizing us, uh, for moderating our talk. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Dayan, to uh, introduce the panel. Thank you, Rudolf, and it's my pleasure to be here and uh, moderate this discussion on this super high level panel. Let me have a quick look through all the speakers. Um, please nod if you can all hear me and if you all have the tone and the view of the discussion. Ingo, can you hear as well? Yes. Perfect. So we really have a very distinguished panel. Uh, Rudolf, I would like to congratulate you that you were able to put this together. And I'd like to thank all of the panelists for taking their time on this high level. I know that you have a lot of things to do, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be with you together. Let me introduce them through the, through the so to say, alphabet. Ingo Blaya is the member of the management board of Este Group Bank, the sponsor of today's event. Ingo, it's great to have you here. Thank you for your time. Then we have Uli Grabenwater with us, Deputy Director, Equity Investments at the European Investment Fund. Uli, welcome. Then we have Gordon Bainai, economist and former Prime Minister of Hungary. Gordon, it's great to have you here. Thank you for taking time from your holiday. And last but not least, Rudolf Kinski, Executive Chairman of AFCO, Austrian Private Equity and Venture Capital Organization. Rudolf, welcome to this your discussion. My name is Daniel Vicevic. I'm the founder of Broadcasten, Austria's publisher for innovation, for startups, for digital economy. And it's a real pleasure for me today to discuss this topic with you, what funding concepts are needed once the short-term bailout programs have run out and we really have top, top competence on this panel. But Rudolf, before we deep dive into the topic, just give us a short overview on uh, why are sufficient levels of equity capital um, important for the economy, just so we have a good frame of the topic. Uh, why do we, why are we talking about, about this topic today? The, yeah, I, thank you, Dayan. Um, well, the, the, the reason that we are, we are raising the issue is that uh, we believe that uh, in order for a, a, a functioning economy uh, to have um, proper inno innovative uh, companies that are scalable um, and that, that can be also be held in, uh, kept in, in the country, um, in order for that to happen, you need sufficient equity capital, capital that is at, at risk. Now, that's not just only true for startups, but that's also true for um, KM, KM, uh, SMEs, uh, small, uh, smaller, medium-sized uh, businesses, uh, and of course also for larger companies. Um, but the only source for, for um, startups are, is either the government uh, through uh, subsidies in the early stages, which is of course very much welcome. And here in Austria, we have a good level of uh, subsidies compared to other countries. But in the, later, in the, in the next stages, um, you need the business angels, you need funds, um, and, and uh, above all, you also need larger uh, institutional investors to invest in, into the into the uh, uh, space and, and, and to invest in, a, in, the, in, in the economy. And that is a, something that in Austria is still not um, in sync. We are still lagging behind uh, comparable countries. We don't have sufficient equity capital. 
And at the moment, the government is supporting us uh, and the startups with a number of uh, welcome programs. But the question to, uh, that we have is what happens after? You know, how can we use the crisis and the needs that we are all see uh, of, of additional private equity and venture capital? How can we uh, make sure that that uh, flows, that capital flows into the into the country and is managed by local uh, funds by, uh, who have the interest of the of the country in mind and, and who uh, then will manage that startups and, and SMEs uh, have not just sufficient capital, but also sufficient support in order to grow, in order to um, focus on their innovations. So that's in a, in a, in a nutshell what, what we are trying to achieve. Um, and we can, we're can happy to discuss the topic further. Maybe I will switch to Ingo now to ask him about the current situation, especially in Austria. Rudolf, since you uh, mentioned Austria, and then as the next question, I would also like to ask you, Gordon, for, uh, let's say, global overview. But first, Ingo, um, do you agree with Rudolf? Do we have an issue here in Austria? Are we aware of the importance of the equity capital for our economy, for growth, for innovation, for startups and entrepreneurship? Yeah, I believe the importance of uh, equity capital uh, is well understood. Uh, I hope you can hear me properly. I had to switch the microphone. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, so overall, I think there is no misunderstanding that um, uh, innovation, development, growth uh, needs a strong uh, uh, equity base uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, non-financial uh, corporates, as we say. Um, regrettably now with the corona induced crisis, um, we are seeing overall a massive increase in debt levels uh, on the state level and all that, you know, um, capital is being used um, to either inject um, uh, direct, uh, you know, state support uh, into companies in the form of uh, Zuschüsse, as we say in Austria, uh, or on, in the form of loan guarantees. So all the, uh, the programs that we're seeing now uh, are very much focused on various debt instruments to fix a, um, uh, a short-term liquidity crunch that uh, everybody was very concerned about. Um, in the longer term, obviously, uh, one needs to think about uh, what can be done on the equity side uh, in order to deal with this massive increase in indebtedness that we are now going to see, both on an absolute as well as in a relative uh, manner. Uh, obviously, if, uh, if um, revenues and earnings are coming down, whilst debt is increasing by, you know, deferred tax, which is a form of debt um, with uh, uh, loans that are being taken with state guarantees um, and other instruments um, in, in that format. Um, uh, we need to see once we're coming out of that crisis, how can we refinance um, and, uh, and change the capital structure? And I think this is the, the point of this afternoon's discussion. Uh, but to go back to your question, of course, the importance of equity capital is understood. Um, and frankly speaking, um, I haven't met anyone in my career so far who said equity is not important. Um, the question is, as to which level is uh, funding equity um, attractive in a certain economic environment and in a certain legal and tax environment? Uh, then let me ask you, do you think that in Austria the, the equity investment is incentivized the way it should be incentivized? Um, and do we have enough of this equity? I remember that before Corona crisis, everybody was telling me there's so much money in the market um, as never before. Is that still the case in Austria? Yeah, there is There is definitely, and I think Gordon will be able to confirm that there's still a lot of dry powder available. Uh, there is no shortage in, in capital in principle uh, that uh, institutional and fund investors would have at their hands. Um, but indeed, it's not very, there's no strong incentive in Austria from a tax perspective. Uh, to go into equity financing forms. Um, uh, obviously, you have uh, um, tax deductible interest rate payments, not so on the equity side. Capital gains, which is a very important factor, obviously, on every equity investment, um, does not enjoy any tax holiday, not even if you invest in publicly traded equity securities. Um, uh, do you have, um, uh, even if you hold for a longer period, uh, relief on the tax side? Uh, on the contrary, you pay a higher tax than on interest payments. In Austria, it's 27.5 on equity returns, uh, while it's only 25 uh, on, on interest um, uh, payments. Um, and, and there is a number of other you know, uh, factors uh, that lead to, um, uh, I would say, the opposite of an incentive in Austria uh, when it comes to, um, uh, to equity structures. 
Um, but still, um, uh, in principle, capital is available in quite significant amounts. Mm -hmm. um, Gordon, uh, as, as Ingo already mentioned, in your capacity as chairman of the Global Advisory Board of Campbell Lut Lutens, the leading global private equity and infrastructure fund advisor, you probably have a very good overview um, around the global, so to say, situation. Do you see there's enough capital in the market? We can move to apologize for my thoughts. I'm trying to deliver a mission and support the Hungarian tourism industry in the north of Balaton. There, there is a, <laughs> it's not a great marketing because the weather is very bad. Sorry for the background noise. But more importantly, um, well, then when this crisis started, everybody suddenly looked back to the, the great financial crisis 10 years ago and tried to understand what is similar and what is different. And I think a number of things, uh, a number of expectations didn't come through. So the first feeling was that uh, learning from 10 year ago experience, there will be an, uh, a liquidity crisis. Well, in fact, I don't see that happening, at least not short term, partly because of the major intervention of governments uh, uh, around the world, governments and central banks, uh, which will have consequences. So the heart attack of uh, of uh, liquidity crisis is not there. The risk is more the cancer of solvency crisis, in my mind, going forward. And solvency is going to be a bigger issue. And that's what makes, by the way, equity financing so relevant. Liquidity crisis is easier to solve with credit. Government are and central banks are for them. But, uh, the equity problem requires a different type of approach. And, and, and banks typically are not allowed to do much of that because of their equity. Uh, 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 limitations. So there has to be some kind of other solution. The we at Campbell Options have reached out to 350 LPs in the last three months just to ask them how they react to the market. And there is a very interesting change in trends and tendencies. So first, in March, when we asked about 100 plus LPs, they globally, this is from Australia to Canada, everyone, uh, they said they were. They were it was a minority who was not worried about liquidity. Today, end of May, about 74% of the people we asked said liquidity is not an issue for me. This crisis is not coming from within the financial sector. It's more of a real economy or demand shock. Therefore, the financial sector keeps going on. Pension funds do receive payments. Insurance companies collect their fees and those have to be deployed somewhere. People, I could be even more opportunistic. People sit on those investment uh, departments and they need to deploy money if they want to earn their bonus at the year end. In that respect, business as usual should return very quickly. When we ask people, is it business as usual or are you putting investments on hold? In, in, uh, as usual, in April it went. We have a slight technical. We have a slight technical issue with Gordon, but I'm sure we will fix it very, very fast. I think it's interesting topic. Uh, Uli, also to involve you with this comparison to the financial crisis. I think the equity uh, investments at European Investment Fund uh, from the from the first crisis brought us a lot of learnings also for the for the status quo. Do you see this similar to Gordon? What are your sort of expectations in this regard? Can we think Gordon? Uli, you have to you have to switch on your microphone. You're muted still. Yeah, go ahead. OK, so sorry, I was talking to myself, obviously. Uh, yeah, I, I, I might take a slightly different view on, on the question of the um, uh, availability of capital for companies in the market and uh, how we are dealing with that in the context no. of the uh, not necessarily say that I have a Can you hear me? I have got yes, yes. Okay. Um, not saying that we uh, that I've got a different view on the availability of capital as such, but um, in the diagnosis of the situation that we are in and how we are going to master that situation in the long run, I think we are in a very different situation than in the 2008 crisis. Um, I would tend to agree that in the current environment, um, we still do have enough equity in the market because the crisis puts in a certain cascade the different models of business. 
um, if you look at the venture space, venture capital companies typically have the uh, the habit they are used to operate without revenue over a long period of time. Business model. Many traditional industries that are not yet in uh, severe recession of equity because um, their uh, need for equity becomes obvious at the point in time that they basically have eroded their equity base, and that requires several months of uh, non revenue situation that we are, we are going through now. But, um, um, there will be a certain point in time, uh, and that will be in the very uh, imminent future, where actually this. Um, Actually, we will hit um, uh, the companies that are out there in the market, and we need to um, to see how we are going to cater for that. And that's where the point comes in, where I think that we've got significant difference mm -hmm. management of the 2008 crisis compared to the crisis that we're having today, because um, we can go about managing this crisis mm -hmm. where we basically have been dealing with fixing a problem fixing a problem in the sense of providing sufficient equity to the market so that we get to the crisis and the uh, three, four. Now, I think we lost you, Julia, as well. Hello. Yeah, we lost you for a second. I'm back on? Yes. Okay. What I'm saying is that in the current situation, what we have asked, need to ask ourselves is whether fixing the problem is actually uh, enough for um, um, dealing with this crisis, whether the question is um, just to get back to normal or whether we need to make our economy more resilient for um, the type of, uh, systemic problems that we're going through. And for that, actually, we need to be aware that we cannot just uh, pump money into the market to fix the problem at the level of companies, traditional businesses first, innovative businesses second, but we need to actually see how we can deploy capital in a way to make our entire business model uh, spectrum that we are running um, uh, more resilient for these type of situations. So I think that is the challenge that we are facing. Do you have any concrete idea how, how, to, how to do that? Yeah, I think we are we are um, uh, always um, this discussing uh, from the institutional investor space, for instance, um, whether venture capital or uh, innovation funding innovation is is a competitive uh, asset class to invest in. And of course, we, of course, we can make the comparison based on historic track records and the risk return profiles and the like. But uh, I think what we needed to understand the current crisis is that the business models that we are going to see in the future have nothing to do with the business models that we have today in our portfolios. And um, institutional investors might have to have a different look at the alternative I, I, I didn't understand the last the last sentence that you said, but uh, maybe I would go to Ingo. Um, you mentioned already that uh, we are increasing debt debt levels and that we'd have to think of how to refinance them. Maybe the same the same question then to Uli. Do you have concrete so to say measurement in mind? Uh, do you have any so to say advice that you, we could also give to the government and all the institutions working on that? Yeah, I can. Uh, it seems that there's a lot of technical uh, problems on the connection. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes. Yeah. Um, let me give you a number yeah, so that uh, bankers uh, like to talk about numbers. Um, Pre-crisis, we had in Austria an average financial debt to equity ratio uh, of around 80%. Our current estimates following the, uh, the recession that we are going into is that um, in 2021, those are 2018 numbers taken out of Eurostat. 2021, uh, our internal research expects that this number goes from 80% to above 90%, more than 10 percentage points increase um, in average gearing ratios, uh, financial debt divided by equity. Um, so that shows you the, the significance of the shift. Uh, public debt to GDP ratios likewise will go up strongly as well. Now, um, what is our expectation on, uh, on uh, what it will need and want to make sure that we don't get into a larger 
systemic problem out of this. Uh, as Gordon rightfully said, um, now everything was focused on fixing the liquidity side, but with the floods of liquidity also supported by the central banks, um, this is um, you know this is managed on a short term basis. But the solvency gap longer term is what we are really interested to in solve. Um, now to your question on uh, on how this can be done, you will have a variety of forms of public and private equity um, that will be needed um, to uh, increase solvency uh, in the corporate system again. Um, infrastructure, very long term investments typically lend themselves to public programs. Um, I think it um, it uh, is no coincidence that the European uh, Commission has already put forward the draft proposal to channel significant additional amounts through the EIB and the EIF um, uh, to um, fund regional equity vehicles. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, there was some interference. Um, now, uh, the, the draft proposals of the Commission will see another 66 billion uh, to be channeled through the so called uh, FC mechanism that was set up earlier already, um, you know, the, the, the Juncker billions, as, as we call them, um, in order to provide additional uh, equity capital to the real economy. Um, you will need a lot of, you know, local intelligence and fund managers in order to absorb that capital and put it into the, um, uh, the corporate sector in a very adequate way. We on the banking side, as you correctly said, banks are typically not direct corporate equity investors, but still we have a very lively and large asset management franchise. And we see our role in making sure that equity capital, whether available from public or private sources, is channeled through uh, the companies where there is a need. Um, and uh, hence, we will uh, be working on, uh, on different forms um, of equity fund constructs that should help in channeling the funds where they are needed. Obviously, um, you have different forms um, uh, or different corporate situations um, uh, that will require equity investments now. In some cases, subordinated capital minority positions may be sufficient uh, to help through the crisis and you know kickstart uh, growth investments again. And then you have other cases where you will need larger you know, um, equity investments to take over majority or control positions. Um, our concern at the moment is um, that uh, there will be you know, a significant number uh, of corporates that may have a need but do not want to relinquish control or control rights. So the question of corporate governance um, needs to be addressed and, and we also as bankers in that situation need to make sure that there is enough understanding uh, for the need of equity capital and for the various forms that you know equity structures can take. Um, it would be a pity if you know the, uh, uh, the funds that are available on the public and on the private side to strengthen the solvency again could not be invested um, because the take up uh, is not there for you know fear of relinquishing control even in situations where there's an economic difficulty. However, I think there will be a very strong incentive on the side of the state here in Austria, but also in other countries um, to, um, uh, to make corporates understand that they should improve solvency because the amount of public guarantees given now is larger than in any previous period we have seen. And uh, it will not be a few individual cases where those guarantees will be drawn if there is no strengthening of solvency it will be a large number. And uh, nobody here, I think, wants to see the state sitting on a large number of workout situations um, where you know, there is either then a sale of distressed loans or you know, a large number of debt equity swaps that leaves the state, the republic, um, in uh, equity ownership positions. Mm. So our role is one to, on the first hand, um, uh, make sure that the solvency problems are understood various forms of equity are being explained and then to broker the relevant form of equity and to arrange the submission of equity um, to our corporate clients. So this is how I would, uh, I would summarize uh, our position. There is no doubt that solvency strengthening, exactly as Gordon has said, um, will be one of our, the, our key challenges over the next uh, couple of years. But Gordon, this is this is one of the one of the key points, and 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 I'm sorry that, that that we lost you before. It was super interesting what you were saying, and I was going to ask you when do you expect the solvency crisis to kick in, so to say? Is that something that we will be seeing this year, or is that some something that uh, you expect midterm? 
again, but um, uh, so first of all, I think that we need to understand that there's a shock to the economy. If you just put a very simple model of categorizing businesses around the world into two categories, some businesses produce flows like a hotel room, an airline or, or coffee. But uh, those flows are lost forever if people don't consume for three, four months. And if people don't travel as much, they may be lost for a very long time. Other businesses produce cars, spare parts or 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 long long term food. Uh, those those stocks can be those revenues can be recovered once the crisis is over. So the critical question is how deep the unemployment in each of our economies go, because if unemployment goes down potentially, then the aggregate demand for goods, even in the can diminish. And then, uh, the right thing to do is quickly keep those businesses alive, the comes in, keep those businesses alive who employ a lot of people. And that's where governments have a role. But to go back to, to what Uli mentioned, the EPSI program, where I'm also an investment committee member, the EPSI program is a really efficient example of how governments can support the private sector without creating an overarching state involvement in the economy, which is providing guarantees. For example, if the Austrian state, and I'm not speaking on their behalf, obviously, would provide guarantees to banks or venture capital companies in Austria to cover part of the loss, part of the first loss. That wouldn't cause too much to taxpayers, but that would enable bank or venture capital companies to take term risk, risky lending or and then the last thing I want to mention here, I believe there will be a fundamental change after the, after the crisis in the global economy. The kind of globalization turned back to be not fully. Because each major in the world, United States, Europe, realize that they are too much dependent on very long supply chains. And that means that overall mean, may mean a, a loss of profitability and efficiency for the global economy. But this time, strategy and risk management will be more important at the government level than, uh, than uh, profitability or efficiency. Strategic independence will be more important. And therefore, there will be a lot of relocation of this. That's an overall efficiency. But there will be winners of those in, 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 in certain regions. So in Europe, I think the pharma industry, technology as a whole, energy logistics uh, can be winners of this reallocation of business. The question is who will be on the winner side? So there will be a lot of government intervention in strategies, companies which are key, playing, playing a key, key role in their own region. Europe need just to make it for Europe, you need to make sure key role in technology, energy company in European ownership. But it state ownership. It can be private ownership. That's a tendency that I see strengthened. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, Rudolf, I, I'd like to ask you something something interesting that, that Gordon mentioned um, and also stressed out the guarantees for venture capital and, and banks from the state. Can you give us an update? Is that, is that coming in Austria, especially for venture capitals uh, do you have any any latest developments on that on that topic i mean uh, the government the government uh, did um, come up with a, a number of, of measures in the crisis now particularly for startups um, and so short term providing for short term uh, measures um, for example there's one fund um, that doubles the equity that is provided by investors in startups, um, which is a very good measure and is taken up um, rather well at the moment. I think there are over 100 applications already. Um, but that is, you know, just one uh, short term um, measure, uh, which does strengthen uh, equity capital, of course. Uh, but what we need above all uh, is, is the long, longer term view. And at the moment in Austria, and that's uh, somewhat um, I'm now also responding to what Ingo said, uh, uh, and, and they obviously also picked up on it. That, uh, we need to make sure 
that the Austrian institutional investors invest in equity, uh, invest in private uh, and uh, equity and venture capital, which they're currently not doing. According to our statistics, pension funds, insurance companies, uh, the large uh, um, family offices uh, are currently not investing in the asset class. And so to um, find um, uh, uh, platforms, um, fund of funds above all, uh, and I think that's what, what Ingo is also uh, referring to, um, to allow local um, investors, uh, large investors to invest. There's a lot of capital there. There's about, I mean, just um, the, the private um, uh, trusts in Austria have about um, 80, 90 billion euros, um, which are partially invested, but, uh, but a lot of the investments go into real estate, for example. Uh, there are also about 270 billion uh, in uh, just ordinary um, savings accounts, uh, which at this moment, with the inflation, uh, actually show a zero uh, or negative return, uh, um, and therefore is eating up the capital of of the of the uh, savers. So there are a lot of sort of um, structural issues. And the, the tax issues have already been alluded to also by, by Ingo, uh, that we, we need to, uh, in order to have a functioning private uh, equity and venture capital, and therefore capital market, uh, uh, a lot of um, tax changes, uh, not a lot, but there are some tax changes that are, that, that where the discrimination of equity capital vis-a-vis -vis, uh, debt capital uh, needs to be alleviated. So that's one of the issues. The other issue is we do not have enough direct funds in Austria. So we have very few uh, venture capital funds and almost no private equity funds in Austria. So when uh, startups or SMEs are looking for financing, particularly when it comes to, to uh, larger funding rounds or indeed uh, exits or um, um, succession uh, funding, uh, the Austrian uh, economy is dependent on foreign capital, capital that comes in maybe from neighboring countries, but capital also that comes in from, from America, from the US or from, from Asia. And that is OK, but now we are also saying we don't want these funds anymore, the, the funds that are from outside of Europe, or we are putting up at least barriers uh, to entry uh, and make it more difficult for these funds to come into the country. So I think we need, we can't, we need to, you know, uh, find solutions now. Um, and the government needs to think about new measures to uh, improve um, the, the level of funding uh, locally in order to, uh, um, you know, after the crisis yeah, and with all the debt levels that, that Ingo was talking about, uh, in order to properly uh, fund our economy. I mean, Uli, the, the EIF is the biggest fund of funds investment platform uh, in Europe. Do you have any measures that you can you can advise to us and recommend to us on the national level? Well, I think the, the kind of diagnosis that Rudolf was sharing of the Austrian market, um, it is not totally asymptomatic for the entire European continent. Obviously, we have got a number of uh, countries that uh, have made it over the last decade or two uh, into real venture capital hubs in Europe and actually have made uh, uh, made it to a level almost at par with uh, with a, a European uh, with, with US and Asian venture capital environments. But uh, generally, the absence of um, institutional capital is a uniform problem in in a European context. And I think um, I, I can't I can't um, agree more with Rudolf when when he says that. Um, we need to do something uh, to make this asset class uh, more attractive to institutional investors, because if we want to grow businesses out of the European context in a way that incentivizes those businesses also to stay within Europe and become technology leaders made in Europe, then we need to provide them with the opportunity to grow to that level. So uh, yes, the government can do uh, quite a bit on that. And there are man many countries that actually have through their um, national programs um, uh, created um, gateways for institutional investors to, to go into venture capital and private equity. Be it, uh, in, be it in Germany, France is discussing the same thing at the at the time. In the in Finland, they've done quite a, quite a bit in that direction as well. 
So there are programs that actually have proven to be successful in that in that uh, in that way, and that's something that that Austria could and should definitely also look at. But there's also another dimension that I think that is important, and that is uh, um, a, a kind of awareness building in the institutional investor community that. Uh, this is not only about supporting the venture capital industry because it's good for our econ economy. It is also something which institutional investors have to start looking at for the sake of their own business models. Um, if we look at the investment um, uh, returns that we are facing in the current environment, um, an institutional investor in the pension funds or in the insurance business that actually rely on uh, uh, very far deferred cash flows and need to actually meet um, um, cash flow obligations uh, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, down the road. Relying on the revenue models that we create in a kind of predominantly fixed income driven asset allocation today, we know that this is not going to be sufficient. And yet we hardly have got any institutional investor in a European context that opens up to equity investment as, a, as an asset class to generate those returns. And that's something that we need to change, not only uh, from the perspective of the public sector, but also from the perspective of uh, um, the, the um, management of, uh, of insurance companies and pension schemes that we have got in the European context. Uh, what do you think? Why is that the case? Are, are they reluctant in general? Are they, are they not aware also about their business opportunity or is it a regulate, regulative barrier? Well, I, I think it's 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 a regulatory regulatory barrier in on one side, but it's also a mentality barrier. And and, and, and forgive me for, for saying something which is potentially politically incorrect in, in in that context. But if you look at the European institutional investor space, uh, be it in the insurance sector and the pension scheme sector, they still bet on a fixed term, um, a fi fixed in, fixed income uh, instruments, uh, asset allocations to a large extent because some way they feel in the certainty that they're too big to fail. If at a certain point in time, they are not having enough cash flows from their own um, insurance uh, businesses or from their own placement businesses uh, uh, at hand to meet the cash obligations, somebody will step in and uh, cater for that. And that is a fundamental difference that we have between a European context and the US context. In the US, there is no business that is too big to fail. In Europe, we know that we have got a kind of a gentleman agreement in, in, in our economy that there are a few pillars in the financial system that never we will ever let drop. And that mentality we need to change. Very interesting. I mean, uh, Gordon, uh, we're speaking a little bit also about the geopolitics on the, on the fa in the financial meaning. Uh, what do you think is the threat if Europe, let's say in this case, uh, doesn't, doesn't become aware of incentivizing also this private equity capital and capital markets. Also, when we compete with the US, with China, uh, is there a threat that we will have a, like, let's say a sale to, to, to these markets then? I, I think you have to switch on your microphone. Sorry, you're still muted. I, I thought it was a connection okay. issue, but yeah, uh, yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, uh, so I'm very much on board with what Uli just uh, said about we have cultural attitude towards investing in, in fixed income assets and the long standing tradition. Which, which expected that there is actually a return without taking it in fixed income return, and that is gone. Since the GFT years ago, global total fixed income assets that had negative yield was about seven trillion dollars. One year ago, so one year later, it was almost eighteen trillion dollars globally. And then on top of that came COVID, which meant that all the central banks around the world have to come in and continue to reduce interest and yields down. Uh, made a better broadband. So, mm. so that that is means turn that the negative development grade be it government or I think we're experiencing some technical issues again. Maybe it will work 
better. Uh, Gordon, if you switch off your camera, maybe we'll have a stronger connection on your audio side. I think your your connection is off now. So maybe I'll, I'll ask you, Ingo, um, uh, in, in, in your capacity as, as one of the top bankers of the state. So it would be interesting for me to hear your perspective. I think one of the statements that Uli mentioned is that um, this fund of funds uh, structure could be one of the measurements to go also to incentivize institutional investors um, yeah, to invest into, 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 into the economy. Do you, do you think that's, that's applicable? Do you think that's a good way to go to increase these investments into the economy? Yeah, I think it's one of the means uh, that uh, also has been tested already. I mean, fund of fund business exists uh, since many years. Um, so certainly uh, the distribution of capital from larger pool um, uh, investors to small individual, regional or local managers um, makes sense. Uh, obviously, in terms of cost, I mean, everybody on the way wants to earn a certain fee, uh, so it, it's not the cheapest way of you know, distributing capital, um, but um, it, it is tested and uh, it is a meaningful way uh, of uh, collecting larger amounts of uh, equity capital, of diversifying the risks, uh, obviously, um, and channeling money to where it is needed. Um, we shouldn't forget that um, uh, a lot of skepticism along uh, equity investments comes from the fact that um, principal uh, pillars of portfolio theory are often forgotten and, and the most important one uh, is uh, diversification. Um, and if you construct uh, you know, a broad equity portfolio, um, you, you will find that um, whilst you will be moving with the market, um, the risk, you know, is inherently less than if you know put all your eggs in one or two baskets. Yeah, that, that's very basic, um, and fund of funds can help um, in that uh, diversification exercise and pool very large amounts of capital. Um, I would like to refer also to another point uh, that was made um, when it comes to leverage and solvency. Um, we're all expecting now that a lot of equity capital will be required. Um, in order to strengthen the solvency of companies, uh, to make them fit to grow, you know, to weather the crisis. Um, politics at the moment works uh, in a way that it uh, will institutionalize higher debt proportions for a longer period. I think we're yeah. underestimating at the moment uh, what is happening long term. Whilst we all believe equity is very important as a cushion, um, the primary means now to face the liquidity issues is dead. We have established that you know half an hour ago, and that's very visible. That does not mean that politics um, will say, "All right, uh, that needs to be replaced by equity." It could well be that higher levels of debt across various sectors of the economy um, become acceptable. It certainly will be on the sovereign side. We now realize that after years, after the financial crisis, where banks had to strengthen their equity base. Now they are allowed to consume more of their buffers, which inherently means we allow a high leverage in the banking system as well. So that's the, 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 the state systems, the banking systems. Guess what? Um, I think it's very likely that, you know, overall higher amounts of debt will be acceptable uh, in the corporate space for a, uh, for, for a longer term as well, in order to make sure that not too many become insolvent for, as we call in Austria, insufficiency. Yeah? So, as long as liquidity can be fixed, there will not be many who will file for insolvency for insufficiency reasons. Um, so you will find a lot of you know, lower solvency ratios that we believe traditionally need to be fixed and equity needs to be restored, which may well be politically um, uh, acceptable for a longer period now. Um, and, uh, and so overall debt levels across the spectrum, states, banks, and the corporate sectors May become, um, uh, may become, if not cemented, but then at least, you know, um, uh, the real world for quite a number of years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and um, because nobody will want to cause uh, a larger amount of insolvencies. And as I've said earlier, nobody will want the states um, to see a lot of defaults on their guaranteed loans. Yeah? So there may be a lot of debt equity swap requirements in our current thinking. But ultimately, you may see a lot of debt, debt swaps going on and higher debt levels becoming acceptable. This is a very you know, um, uh, interesting question that uh, um, uh, will occupy us, I think, uh, for the coming period. 
Okay, interesting point. Uh, nevertheless, one 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 question back to you um, uh, with regard to the fund of funds. Uh, I, I think we could consider Este Group as one of the institutional investors as well. Uh, in your particular case, you would participate in such a program. Do you see any regulatory barriers? Do you have any, as Uli called it, uh, mentality barriers as, as as for such instruments and measurements? No, in terms of uh, of uh, equity investments, I think our group is uh, is one of the more proactive ones. We were the only bank in uh, participating in the Grunde in Austria, for example. Um, we are the large one of the largest institutional investors now. It's big investor venture capitalist here in Austria. This is public information we can freely speak about. Um, and of course, if we are helping to arrange fund constructs, we would see ourselves as equity investors or anchor investors. Um, we will potentially not participate uh, you know, in, in fund constructs arranged by other uh, financial institutions, but the ones where we contribute on the structuring process and where we want to persuade clients to invest into, it is quite natural that we are going to invest anchor tickets as well. Um, and, um, and as I've said, our asset management uh, arm uh, is a natural broker for such equity solutions mm. um, and will require us as a, as a sponsoring investor with anchor tickets, so that is very likely. Rudolf, do you see any chance uh, in the near future to implement such uh, funded funds? I mean, this was a strong statement from Ingo. No, I welcome uh, that, that that statement. Um, I wish um, you know the, the wider the wider um, of uh, group of uh, Austrian institutional investors would uh, follow. <clears throat> um, we at AFCO, as you know, for a number of years now, um, have been trying to suggest to the government that I. Um, fund of fund should be uh, set up um, that where institutional investors are allowed to invest in, into a bond that has a um, guarantee of the Austrian state. Um, the reason we are suggested that was that um, we saw in two, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the insurance companies, um, there would be a lower level of um, capital underlying capital necessary, uh, but we also um, um, constructed it uh, such that um, pension funds can invest more easily. Um, and um, so far we have unfortunately not gotten any green light from the government. Uh, now that, um, you know, with the uh, current crisis where a lot of guarantees are uh, being given by the state for, for increased debt actually, um, we, are, we are hopeful that um, our argument will at some point uh, fall on, on fertile ground and we can we can proceed uh, with our program, uh, but we need the support of the government. By the way, the European Investment Bank have already agreed uh, that they will participate in this uh, in, 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 in the guarantee. And why, why are we suggesting that? We're suggesting it because we also see the need for more uh, venture capital and private equity funds in our economy, because the role is not just to distribute capital, the role is also to support the companies in which they are invested, to support them in their growth, to support them in their development, uh, human resource as well as um, business-wise, um, and and particularly um, fast-growing companies, and that's, those are the the um, startups and and innovative uh, SMEs needs that sort of support. Um, you know, if they are left to their own devices, um, they you know they. The vagaries of, of the today's world and competitive global situation, um, you know, they often can't afford um, consultants and uh, therefore these funds play a very important role in, 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 in supporting uh, fast growing companies. So that's another reason we are saying that. But also uh, maybe another reason is that we need in Austria, when we have the chance in Austria uh, to become a regional, a, a regional uh, capital market, a regional funding market. Uh, we are in the middle of Central Europe uh, and the situation in other European countries is quite similar to Austria. So if we're able to provide some uh, equity capital in Austria, not just for, for um, Austrian businesses, but businesses around, uh, maybe we, there's a chance also to develop a regional capital market. That's sort of a, um, a, a vision that we have at least. Okay. okay, we have a few yeah. minutes left, so I'd also like to invite our audience to post questions in the chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to write your question here and I'll, I'll make sure 
to take, take this question as well. I, I'd like to go back to, to Gordon. Um, Gordon, maybe you can help us also understand the global best practices in this in this field. Uh, do you have any sort of experiences in, uh, as for how to incentivize this in institutional money to flow, to have to, to have it as a part of our equity, equity capital infrastructure in our countries? Definitely. Allow me now to switch on the camera to avoid uh, drop the room door. Uh, obviously, the most uh, relevant one is tax, and then uh, it is for longer term equity investments. It's not, although equity capital in, in stock exchange is also, uh, if you keep your money, part your money in longer term investments, that should certainly be incentivized through the personal income tax or even. If you use your own company's uh, uh, reserves uh, to put into that, uh, so that's the obvious one. Another one is uh, which I mentioned at the industry level, at the, at the venture capital, private equity industry level. Uh, I typically, first loss guarantees. Helpful. I think we're experiencing some technical problems again i think the the weather conditions in in, in the hungary make it difficult for 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 the signal to come to austria on time uh, so maybe I'll, I'll 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 go to uli in the in the meantime uh, same question do you do you think uh, compared to the question of, of of best practices do you think that we are this discussion is taking place in a bubble where we're aware of these issues is there awareness out out outside this bubble and what kind of ex advices can we give to yeah to the politicians that want to do something about it well uh, first of all um let me start with not bashing outrightly everything that comes from the public sector is being insufficient let us be also aware that uh, we are indeed dealing with a situation that is um, is is exceptional and um, uh, obviously, uh, governments across the continent and across the globe, actually, as we speak, um, are trying to, um, to, to to shuffle the water off the boat in the first instance. But I think that is precisely the important uh, uh, reminder of awareness building that, uh, that um, as an industry we can give, as uh, like like AFCO as an industry organization can give, is that in the midst of the storm, in the eye of the hurricane, we need to look at what can make our economic environment more resilient um, in the future against this type of uh, systemic shocks. And for that, we indeed need to find ways of, of making, uh, making these asset classes that create funding for innovation, that create funding for technology, um, that create business models that make us more um, resilient, more competitive in the, in the long run that those those um, asset classes become attractive for institutional investors and that can in the first instance indeed be by sharing um, downside risk and uh, a number of countries um, have um, um, have or are working on this type of uh, um, instruments to to make it attractive for institutional investors to get into that asset class um, but uh, it, it's also a um, a question of um, um, creating um, creating a tax environment that actually makes it attractive for institutional investors. For instance, um, uh, it could be an idea of, of privileging uh, the participation of institutional investors in technology IPOs in the European context. We know that in the European context we have got a massive problem that uh, companies um, are reluctant to go to the public market in Europe because they know that basically with the moment where they go public, they lose the access to uh, the capital rather than gaining it because nobody is interested in, in investing in a post IPO funding round in a technology company that still hasn't the sufficient revenues to prove that they have got the uh, price earning ratios that are competitive and things like that. And if we create a, a funding environment in the public market where uh, companies that actually for the value of the business proposition of those companies stick with them for one, two, three, four years uh, after the IPO and uh, provide stability in, in, in the trading environment of those companies. That will give us scale that will also create a momentum for analysts to cover that market segment. And that will create eventually an ecosystem that um, will take away many of the uh, impediments of the hurdles that the institutional investors today cite for not being active in that, in that environment. And I think the public sector 
um, uh, in, in creating very targeted stimulus in, in that respect can actually do a great deal um, in that. The question obviously in the first place is, do we want to have that from the public sector perspective? And uh, I do believe that the current crisis um, um, has given us sufficient material to answer that um, uh, that question of whether we want to have that environment with um, with with nothing but a big yes. I mean, the counter question would be why would we not want to have that? Uh, what are the threats? Are there any major threats or is it rather a no brainer to go along this strategy? Well, I think there's always a uh, in every economic uh, ecosystem, there's always a com competition between traditional businesses and innovation. Uh, you, you can also look at the at the business models that have made the headlines in, 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 the, in the recent past, like like Uber, like Airbnb, and things like that. They have been they have been unsettling entire industry branches, and we had debates of whether they should be uh, banned from certain markets, whether they should be taxed uh, differently because they're doing unfair competition, things like that. And all those are very justified questions, but we need to find from a public sector perspective. We need to find different ways to answer those questions than just by restricting innovation. Especially because it's rather it's proven to be rather impossible to restrict innovation. Innovators find their find their ways, and I think if we restrict our own innovation, we leave these markets yeah, to, to 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 the rest of the world. Don't don't you see that that strong threat? I, I can't I, I can't agree more. Actually, we cannot stop innovation by regulation. Um, Already today, I mean, 10 years ago, we could we could basically rule what's coming to the market. Today, when we discuss regulation for certain certain sectors, the debate sometimes starts when the companies out there in the market are valued um, a billion dollar or more. And we can just can decide whether those companies are going to sit within Europe or outside. But that's the only question. And as for today, the answer is very clear. They're not sitting in Europe. Uh, you know, Wirecard, uh, if if they would go off of the of the Ameri uh, of the German stock exchange, um, guess how many tech companies would still be listed on DAX? One. That's 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 a, a dramatic, so to say, so to say, geopolitical fact. Um, if you ask me, so uh, I, I think it's very important point point that you're making. Um, uh, we're slowly running out of time. Maybe Ingo, uh, what's your outlook? Uh, what's your outlook? Do you do you think that that we're discussing about these topics and all going back to normal, or is any change coming? Do you, you you're speaking to, so to say, yeah, top politicians and and top CEO colleagues from 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 the country and abroad? Do you think things are moving? Do you think that Corona crisis will boost something that we've been debating about for many, many years? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, more than at any time before, uh, at least during my uh, more than 25 years in banking, uh, I see a realistic chance that uh, there will be more mobilization of equity capital uh, across various fund, uh, also public equity structures. So my outlook is that uh, not only will the topic uh, be very important, but um, uh, we will see a lot of um, uh, also innovation coming along uh, to make sure that um, all those state guaranteed debt programs can at least be partially um, uh, refinanced with um, uh, various forms of equity. So I have a, whilst on, on the economic outlook in the short term, I'm pretty skeptical, I have to say, with the deep recession we are getting into, uh, high numbers of unemployment, uh, lower consumption levels. Uh, in all the markets where we are active, in all the seven countries, we have um, economic growth outlook next year. So a deep recession this year, growth next year. Um, however, not to a level that we had before 2020. So we will not see 2019 levels 2021. So my outlook is one of uh, growing economic activity uh, after this year, but not to the previous level. Um, and um, uh, a lot of work to address the solvency gap and uh, we will play our role in it. Uh, I've seen now the questions on the uh, uh, Q&A chat. Um, one question was uh, that we are not uh, providing uh, guaranteed loans um, to, a, to a company that uh, needs venture capital. I have a short answer there. Um, I think we will need um, uh, equity forms uh, to fund venture capital and not debt uh, and whether the state guarantees the debt or not, debt is not the right way to fund startups or venture capital. 
um, that needs to be done by equity sources. Um, and then there was another question uh, on whether I think a leverage cap um, uh, on our corporate lending, so they will not be allowed to lend, for example, to levels beyond five times debt equity. So a regulatory cap uh, would lead to, um, uh, to more equity formation. I'm not convinced you already now have um, a cap of six times, but companies can get to a higher leverage even if they don't take the debt, but if EBITDA comes down, you get to a higher leverage. So we would suddenly then break the regulation if this would happen without having provided additional debt. Um, so I'm not in favor of increasing regulatory burdens um, in order to generate more equity for the companies. Yeah, so in response to this question um, that was brought up as well on the uh, FNA. Thank you um, for, for that's my questions as well. I was in the I was in the wrong chat and I didn't see the questions. We're already wondering whether some some of them would come. Um, my apologies to the audience as well in 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 this concern. In the other chat, there was obviously no questions because I was in the wrong one. Um, maybe uh, Gordon, your outlook. Um, do you do you still hear us? Yes. Okay, maybe we are still experiencing some problems with 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 Gordon. Let me also try to let me also try to see um, some questions if I can take one very quickly. And again, I apologize for not seeing them. Um, Uli from Sebastian, maybe one question to you. What do you believe the Austrian government needs to do in order to enhance equity supply to Austrian corporates? Well, I think we, we, we've covered that, that topic um, to, to, to some extent already. It's um, creating incentives for equity investments in an asset allocation of institutional investors. I think uh, that's uh, the, the, the biggest uh, element. Uh, um, I don't think that the solution is to provide a public funding in form of equity to, um, uh, uh, to, to the industries and, and to cater for the shortfall, shortfall of equity in that. Um, I genuinely believe that the private equity industry is called private equity industry for a reason and the venture capital industry being part of that. I think it is an industry that should be borne by the private sector. Um, we have actually at European Investment Fund taken up our activities just after the thought technology crash in 2000 and uh, had the task of catalyzing private sector money into that space. At the time, we wanted to give the industry back to the private sector, but the private sector didn't want to have it. I think today we are in a massively better situation than, uh, than what we've been at that time. It is up to um, uh, the government and the regulator to find the right incentive schemes to bring the private sector into game, but uh, it's not the role of the public sector to basically monopolize the industry. That wouldn't help. Mm -hmm. Rudolf, maybe closing remarks from you. Thank you Ingo, also for taking the rest of the questions, if I can see correctly. Um, we are advanced with our time and our speakers obviously have other appointments as well to comply with. Rudolf, I, I found that was a fantastic, really, really interesting discussion, especially uh, for myself, who is for somebody who is not dealing on the daily basis with these topics. Um, a lot of clarity, a lot of really, really clear statements. I, I, I think, I think so to say that we were uh, able to work out what needs to be done. How realistic is, is it to happen from your perspective? First of all, um, thank you very much for all the participants um, and sorry for the technical issues that uh, Gordon had to face uh, and also apologies to the audience uh, for that. Um, these are the vagaries of um, our current world where we have to um, do these uh, things on a, on a virtual basis. Sometimes the technical uh, um, side doesn't live up to it. Um, as far as the topics, uh, thank you very much for debating it so broadly. Uh, I, think, I think what it shows is that if we need a good co uh, cooperation between public and private uh, interests and public and private um, um, institutions uh, in order to come up with the right solution. So uh, the banks, the institutional investors um, and um, people like us in, in sort of in the middle needs to work with government, need to um, make sure that um, it is understood that we need the support, but at the right level of support. We need uh, the incentive structures, we need uh, the, 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 the right uh, tax structures in order to um, 
provides the, the private <coughs> investors a, a good reason, a, a good economic base uh, to invest, to make sure that the risk that they are taking, particularly if they invest in equity capital, are, are commensurate um, to the return that they're getting. And I think there is a lot to be done here. On the other hand, there is also a lot of inexperience still uh, on the part of um, the institutional investors, particularly when it comes to smaller uh, in, uh, insurance companies, smaller uh, pension funds that just don't have the personnel. So th there's a lot of um, things that need to be thought about in order to get um, the right funding into the economy um, to, to, to make up for the, uh, the level of debt, but particularly to, to also uh, provide sufficient capital um, for uh, investments in innovation. And I think that's where we are coming from. Uh, we, we need um, in the in the times when the economy is, is uh, getting started again, uh, is sufficient capital needs to be provided in order to, for a country like Austria to be competitive, to be competitive vis-a-vis -vis, um, particularly Asia, but also uh, competitive together with all the other European countries, uh, with be the US. I think that is a it's a very important economic issue, an issue for our children as well as for, for you know, employment um, and, and therefore we are, we are continuing the effort. And thank you very much um, to you, Dan, to provide uh, such an, a good uh, lead in, in, in moderating this uh, discussion uh, despite all the technical issues as well. So thank you very much to all. Thank you, Rudolf. Thank you, thank you gentlemen, thank you. for your time and thank you, audience, for being with us. That was it. That was the first AFCO roundtable. I'm excited about the topics to follow. Stay tuned. We'll keep uh, so you, you informed. Thank you all, guys, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.